Good evening, and welcome to the Faculty Research Seminar, the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. My name is Eric Jones, and I'm Professor of European Studies, and I'm also the, the person who gets to host this event. Um, now, what we're going to do tonight is something that we try to do uh, at SICE as often as we can, and that's present you with a role model for an interesting and varied and tremendously successful career in international affairs. Now we looked far and wide to, to find a role model that we think would be appropriate. Uh, in, and as we scanned the globe, we discovered just down in Florence, an amazing example of things that you can do with a degree in international affairs. And I'm not kidding because our speaker tonight who's the Right Honorable Kim Campbell, former Prime Minister and 19th Prime Minister of Canada, started out her academic career uh, as a PhD scholar at the London School of Economics doing Soviet studies. Uh, and, and then went from that uh, and decided that she would study in law. Uh, and from that, ended up going into local government as a school board trustee. Uh, and then moving from local government to provincial government and from provincial government to national government. She was Canada's first female justice minister, which made her also attorney general of Canada. She was also, I believe, the first minister of defense and of veteran affairs who was uh, a woman. Uh, and then she became Canada's first uh, female prime minister. And having finally outgrown Canada, she decided to move on. Uh, where she's been doing a number of outstanding things with the International Women's Forum, with the Club de Madrid, uh, <clears throat> and also with the Kennedy School at Harvard. I guess now finally we get her at size, uh, but with the Kennedy School at Harvard. And then she went back to the University of Alberta, where she was the founding principal uh, of their School of Leadership, uh, before deciding that the time had come really to learn uh, what Italian life has to offer. Now, what we're going to do is, is have a conversation uh, with Prime Minister Campbell about her career and the very many different aspects of it. In order to have that conversation, I've asked my dear friend and colleague, Veronica Engel, uh, who is a PhD in international relations from the University of Bucharest, uh, who has just completed a period of study as a Fulbright scholar at Stanford University and is now a Max Weber fellow uh, at, at the European University Institute in Florence. So I've asked Veronica to come up from Florence uh, along with Kim uh, in order to have this conversation uh, so that we can make sure that the questions fly back and forth and that the conversation is lively. Now, having said that, I'm gonna get Veronica to ask the first question and most of the questions in the middle, but at some point we're gonna run out of questions of our own. And so we'll need you uh, both those of you online uh, and, and those of you here in the room uh, to put some questions as well. If you're online, please put your questions in the question and answer section, which you'll find uh, in the middle to the left at the bottom of your screen. So if you hover your mouse over the Zoom thing, uh, you'll see that, that below that there's all the, a chat window. Don't use the chat window. And then there's the Q&A window. Please do use the Q&A window. Uh, so you'll be able to ask questions there and I'll ask the questions on your behalf. Uh, those of you in the room, once you feel like that we've had our conversation long enough, you can start uh, edging your hands up and we'll certainly encourage you uh, to participate. The only thing I'll ask and I'll ask this, or I'll repeat this again in the future is that you identify yourself uh, when asking a question and also so that the people in Zoom land can hear you that you wait for the microphone to come around so that you ask your question in a way that, that's audible both uh, to the room and to those people online, okay? Having said that, um, first, I would hope that you would join me in thanking the Right Honorable Kim Campbell, former Prime Minister of Canada, for coming all this way up to see us. She drove up just for this event and she's gonna drive back right after. And it's a real treat to have her here. Thank you so much. I was scrambling around trying to make sure that I could take my cell phone and turn the, uh, the ringer off. <laughs> okay, Veronica, over to you. Okay, so you forgot the most important thing. I also spent last year at SAIS <laughs> and, uh, and we're still working here together. 
Um, and um, I miss Sai so much that I had to you know, stay in Florence just so I can come here every now and then. Um, the most interesting, one of the most interesting things that happened to me last year uh, was at a conference in Canada where I had the honor to be on a panel with uh, Kim Campbell. Uh, and the panel was on, called Democracy on the Run? Question mark. And it was organized by the International Leadership Association. Uh, with whom um, Kim, Prime Minister Campbell has a very good relationship. And um, on this panel, we were, uh, I think we were five of us to two women, which is already one too many as when we're used in panels to not be uh, that many. And um, it was, it was very, it, it was very interesting. It was an audience of mostly Americans and the atmosphere was mostly of doom and gloom. We were preparing for the meeting of this year that was supposed to come just after uh, the elections in the US. And uh, a lot of people were, were very, um, let's say, uh, worried or concerned about the state of democracy in many ways. Our panelists, co-panelists were also painting a, not a great picture about the state's status of democracy. And at some point, I think we became allies. That's how I, I remember, uh, as we were trying to be on the side of uh, more moderation. And as I was trying to explain that, you know, we have all these uh, institutions in many countries that are constraining elite behavior and so on, and was doing a very, not maybe the best job, but trying to, to get people to understand that it's not the end of the world. Kim did the most amazing thing. She stepped into this role as, a, as an actual leader and completely changed the direction of the conversation from problem description and whatever we were doing there to problem solving. And I remember that this was, was a quite an amazing feat to watch because the whole conversation all of a sudden became about, okay, what can we do? What are we supposed to do? Uh, and in different roles that we have in life. So I would like to get this started by actually asking you something to draw from your political career. You took, you actually, you ran for the leadership of the um, Progressive Conservative Party at a time when the party was not doing great uh, in the polls, at a time when uh, Canada was going through an economic crisis. Uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister uh, was not favored by, by many, um, uh, by most of the people uh, who were up for, the, um, uh, for to vote in quite soon. And yet you ran, you took over the party um, and proceeded to, to try to solve some of the problems of both the party that you are uh, a member of for, for quite a while. Um, and then continue to do so uh, as prime minister. And that's for someone who is thinking of what's the best decision making to do. How do you make a decision knowing how difficult is the road that you have set up for yourself? Um, well, um, you know, maybe I just have, you know, I'm, I'm a bit, I have a recessive gene that <laughs> makes me not too rational. Um, recently in Canada, if I just the other other week, um, I was doing some interviews because another former prime minister, a man named John Turner, uh, passed away at 91. John Turner became prime minister in 1984 at the end of Pierre Elliott Trudeau's time. And when Pierre Elliott Trudeau left office, he was incredibly unpopular. People hated him. It's interesting, as years go by, um, people's views of politicians often uh, get adjusted, they, they get sort of the longer term view and they're, they're more balanced in their assessment, but he was very much disliked. And John Turner had been a member of his party, a member of his caucus, he was a little bit younger than, than the, the elder Trudeau. But um, when he had run for the leadership in 1968, Trudeau had won and uh, so John Turner became a member of his cabinet, who was in government and was minister of finance, etc. But eventually it became clear that Trudeau wasn't going anywhere. And in fact, John Turner's mother said, when is that man going to go? John is never going to be a prime minister. <laughs> so he finally left, went back to private, practice, private law practice. And then nine years later, when Pierre Elliott Trudeau finally did step down and had to be replaced, John Turner became leader. But the timing for him was also not great. And John Turner was actually a prime minister for half as long as I was because he became leader of his party. His party was, a gov was the governing party, so he became prime minister, but he didn't have a seat. 
and he'd been out for a long time and uh, so he was kind of out of practice of being an active politician and he led his party to a historic defeat uh, in, in the uh, 84 election. <clears throat> because he's a man, he got a second chance. This is something that, that I just you learn that you know, girls don't get a second chance. But anyway, um, he stayed on as leader till the next election, which they lost again. And he stepped down and uh, went into other fields, went back to legal practice. But he was always very committed to the rule of law, the democratic process. He, he had also been a minister of justice, as I had been. And the reason why I'm, I'm making this point is that you don't always get to choose your timing. John Turner had wanted to be prime minister for a long time. And when he was a young man, he was the most dazzlingly handsome man you can see. But he was a Rhodes Scholar. He had gone, he, although he'd grown up in, uh, uh, in Eastern Canada, in, in Ottawa, he came out to UBC in Vancouver to, for university. And he was an Olympic class a sprinter. He would have been in the Olympic Games, but he had an injury and couldn't go. He was, he wrote the sports column for the student newspaper. He was Chip Turner. He was a real, you know, big man on campus, as they say. I mean, he was really a dazzling star. And everybody saw him as having a great future. But when the time came, which when he could, in theory, run, he was beaten out by Pierre Trudeau at a time when Canadians were more preoccupied with the Quebec uh, situation, the, the language division in Canada. And by the time his time came around, um, people were tired of his party. And so in 1993, when Brian Mulroney announced he was going to step down as leader of the party, um, I had been a minister in his government and I had uh, a lot of people uh, and I was just telling some of the other students, when I first went to Ottawa, it was a junior minister of Indian Affairs and Northern Development. And I would be invited to go and speak in people's constituencies at their annual general meetings. And, and I would speak and people would come up to me after and say, well, when Mulroney steps down, you're going to be our next leader. And it was always a little embarrassing because you don't want to be seen to be aspiring for a position in which there isn't currently a vacancy. And especially when that position is your boss. Um, but so... It, 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 and, and, but, and when Marini stepped down, over half of the caucus declared their support for me. And this was extraordinary because I had, uh, as Justice Minister, passed a lot of very contentious legislation um, <clears throat> that had been divisive in my party, legislation related to sexual assault, gun control, a very divisive issue in Canada. And yet people who had opposed my legislation supported me. And I remember I was defense minister at the time that the, uh, the leadership was called. And one of my colleagues uh, came to see me and I had actually asked his help on my gun control legislation he'd set up. He chaired a special committee for me. And he came to see me and he said, um, you know, I'm sort of chair of the Evangelical Caucus. Now I'm from Vancouver Center. I'm a very socially liberal, progressive, urban person. You know, my riding had the biggest gay population. And I mean, I was, you know, I was in the very much in the socially liberal uh, part of things. And he was chair of the Evangelical Caucus. And he said, uh, if you become leader, will you treat us with the same respect you did when you were justice minister? And I said, well, John, you know, I'm the same person I've always been. And, you know, my door is always open to you. And I'm, you know, and he said, because we would like to support you. And it was really quite extraordinary because they were 180 degrees from me on a lot of issues. But over the course of my time as a minister, they had come to trust me and they knew that I said what I thought. They knew they weren't always on the winning side of arguments. They knew they weren't going to, you know, it wasn't just me, that they were not going to carry the day in a lot of the things that they believed in. But they had always felt they could talk to me, they respected me. So, so when Ramoni stepped down, it was almost like I didn't have a choice to run. How could I say, well, I'm not going to run because I don't think we can win because it was very much the same scenario as in 1984 when John Turner, uh, in his case, finally got his chance. But Canadians were, they didn't like uh, Pierre Trudeau, they were tired of the Liberals and they wanted to change. And my predecessor, Brian Mulroney, at that time in 1993, was the most unpopular prime minister in the history of Canadian polling. In the summer of 1993, after I had become leader, I became, uh, I was elected to leadership in, in June, um, and in the summer of 93, Gallup said that I had the highest approval rating for a prime minister in 30 years, which incidentally included all of the Trudeau years. But I didn't have time to put a new face on the party. 
we were in the fifth year of our mandate. And those of you who know what a parliamentary system is, you have a maximum of five years. You normally never go into the fifth year of your mandate. Sometime around the, in the fourth year, uh, you, you try and find a propitious time to call an election. Uh, you know, we were already, uh, the, 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 the fifth year started in uh, November of 1992. And so by June of 1993, you know, the clock was ticking and I had to, so the, the, I called an election in September. Otherwise, you know, the constitutional hook would have been there pulling me off the stage whether I wanted to go or not. So again, the timing was awful and I knew it. And I worried about whether if I ran and became leader and became the first woman prime minister of Canada and couldn't win an election, would that, set things back for women. That was my concern. And then I thought, well, all I can do is do my best. If, if I say to the party, I don't want to run. And yesterday, other senior ministers wanted to run and they didn't have any support. And one of my, my colleagues who had wanted to be prime minister since he was a little kid, Perrin Beattie, you know, he was dying to run. He didn't have any support. And he said, I'm not going to run because the party wants Kim. And all, the only way I could even have a campaign would be to attack her in ways that would be damaging and what good would that be when comes an election. So it, it, it almost, I almost didn't have a choice. You know, if, if I had said I'm not going to run, you know, I wouldn't have had any future in that party anyway, because A, because we were going to lose the election massively, but also because I would have been seen as somebody who bailed out when, when the party needed me. But I think what I did do was I, I had wanted to, uh, our, the cabinet had become very large. I, re I reorganized the ministries of the government and, and many of the things that I did then back in 1993 have stayed. I created the Department of Canadian Heritage, I created the Department of Public Safety, a lot of things that, have, that are still there in the government. And, uh, but also to be the first, I was the first one to experience what it would be like to lead an election as prime minister as a woman. And there were a lot of things that I didn't understand, but that later I came to understand because in later in the 90s, there was a burgeoning of wonderful research in social and cognitive psychology about gender barriers and you know why the way we think we think isn't really how we think and what are some of the problems that, that, that women face and why they face them. Um, but if I hadn't done it, I don't know what that would have meant because since then, and again, I was asked this just, just, just a few minutes ago, um, there have been, a, to be a prime minister in Canada, you have to be elected leader of a party that can form a government. So we have had other women party leaders, but they were not leaders of parties like the Green Party, the New Democratic Party that never really were in the running to form a government. So people let, okay, we'll let, we'll let the girls run that one because they're never gonna be a government and it's never gonna be a problem. But the parties that have a, 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 a fighting chance to form a government, there have been, I think about 14 or 15 leadership changes since I was prime minister. And in none of those has a woman even got to the second ballot. Uh, it's very hard. It's, it's, it's about power. But I believe, and I don't think I'm saying this just to make myself feel better. I don't think my experience has actually, was actually responsible for women. And, and nobody said, well, look what Kim Campbell did. We're never having another woman. I think people recognize that people that came up be for years and say, that wasn't your loss. It was Mulroney's loss. He waited till the very end. There really wasn't, you know, you got had a, a raw deal, et cetera, et cetera. But what I also discovered, and when I went back to Alberta in 2014, I'd been out of the country for a long time. When I went back to create the Peter Lahey Leadership College, what people, would, women would say to me, it meant so much to me. When you were prime minister, it just changed the way I looked at things. And it was just so exciting. And I had your picture on my wall and you realize that for many people, they didn't focus on the fact that we couldn't win the election after because they knew there was a very good, whoever had become leader of the Progressive Conservative Party wasn't gonna win an election. But the fact that I had been there and they had seen me doing all the things that a prime minister does. You know, I did, participated in the G7 summit. Uh, I addressed the General Assembly of the UN. I did all of these things. The fact that I changed the, the, the ministries. That created a sense of possibility for, 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 for women. And now I find in Canada that I've kind of become an icon. And when I go people, you know, I'm the one that they call, you know, when we now have a female minister of finance, who do the TV says they all call for you know, my comments. And it's not that I always want to blab away. But the point is that, that you sometimes just have to wait long enough 
And when John Turner died, people didn't say John Turner was too late, had a big defeat, his, you know, his career was a disappointment, he never got to be Prime Minister. No, they talked about what a distinguished public servant he'd been, what a good minister of justice he'd been, how profound was his commitment to the rule of law, and how even when he was out of politics, he never stopped talking to young people about the importance of democratic governance and why it matters to them. So I say this to you also because many of you will have failures. Uh, every time you have an election, more people lose than win. And many of you will go for something and it's not going to work out. But if your, if your heart is pure, if you do things because you really want to make a difference and you give it your all, you will be surprised how after all the, the smoke is cleared and all the kerfuffle and all the pointing and, you know, and the press all have to, you know, they have to make these you know, dramatic stories, you know, and there's a winner and there's a loser and, you know, blah, blah, blah. After that's all cleared and sensible people are looking at, uh, at that history, you'll be fine. First of all, you may get another chance, in which case go for it. But if you were part of an honorable effort to build something that matters, and I can't tell you how important democracy is. You know, I'm here in Italy. My dad was in the Canadian Army in World War II. My mother was actually joined the, her for her mother joined in the Navy and she was a, a wireless, she was a wren and she tracked new boats in the North Atlantic and Gulf of St. Lawrence. You know, a submarine can't communicate underwater so they would surface and go, they, 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 and my mother was part of a team of young women. You had to be young and they would sit there and scanning and if two stations could identify the same message, they could identify, they could send out planes or submarines against, uh, against the, the German submarine. But my dad was in the Canadian Army and he enlisted in 1939 and spent the whole war trying to get sent overseas. And finally, in late 1944, he was sent overseas as part of the Italian campaign. And he fought not far from here. And his, his best friend, Leo Charbonneau from Gravelberg, Saskatchewan, is buried in the Canadian Military Seminar, Cemetery, Cemetery in Ravenna. Um, and there, my first husband's cousin uh, is buried in Ortona. There are many Canadian boys, really, is what they were, young men and boys, lying in graves here in Italy, who came to fight to preserve the possibility for democracy. And incidentally, every time you see a Canadian war cemetery, uh, and in, it's worth looking at them, especially if uh, those of you are Canadians, every, every and, and they were men then, because it was, women weren't in combat then. They're all volunteers. We had no conscription for overseas service. We had conscription for domestic service, but every Canadian who lies in a war grave in France or Italy was a volunteer agreed to come. And all I can say is what people paid for the possibility of my generation and your generation to live with democratic governments, imperfect as they are. And I was just reading an amazing article about the people in Italy who were fighting the mafia, the prosecuting judges, and what they live with in this judge who lives in constant, under constant security, in a gated residence, but he's got a little vegetable garden in his courtyard. And he finds beauty where he can, because the most important thing for him is to have the courage to protect Italians and preserve the rule of law in this society. So when you get a chance to do something, you know, in the cosmic order of things, your worst failure with the big headlines and all the people jumping on, and believe me, and if you're a woman, they'll all pile on. But, you know, at the end of the day, compared to being Leo Charbonneau lying in the, lying in the cemetery in Ravenna at 22, um, it's pretty small potatoes. So that's a very long answer to a short question, like, why did I do it? <laughs> I told you I did it amazing. Because it matters. Mm -hmm. And it's not about me. I was really good at what I did, and I am proud of my history as a legislator and things that I stood for. And people whom I respect, admire it, and you know, are happy that I did it. But that isn't really, you know, what really matters is the big picture. And we are living in very difficult times. I am terrified 
about resurgent authoritarian. I was a Soviet specialist in my youth, as you heard, and watching what's happening, uh, you know, with, with Putin and this resurgent authoritarian and Orban and what's happening in Poland, watching what's happening south of the border uh, of Canada with Donald Trump and the attack on the rule of law, the attack on democratic norms. It matters. It never stops mattering. And there's never a day when you go into bed and you pull the covers over your head and you say, we've sorted it all up. It's all going to work on autopilot. No, it's not. Prime Minister, but I'm going to make it about you again. So, I, I mean, you, you Sorry, really... Sorry, that's a long answer to a short question, but I, <laughs> no, I never really thought about it that way, but now I'm at, that I've answered it, I'm glad I did. Yeah, that was a great answer. But you've, you've also set us up for, even, I mean, a, a great you've tackled so many important issues um, during uh, particularly when you were the minister of justice like abortion gun control sexual assault um uh, women's rights gay rights and there's that's it's a lot uh, to to do and to try to do and I, i'm thinking is it to some extent the fact that as a as a woman you have to do much more to prove yourself than uh, a man would well, we had a, the first woman to be mayor of the city of Ottawa. Uh, it was a woman called Charlotte Witten, and she was wonderful. And I grew up with her famous saying that a woman had to be twice as good as a man in order to be thought half as good, but fortunately that's easy. Uh, <laughs> um, but you know, I, thought, I think what it was was more that every time I held elected office, and this goes back to when I was in the school board, uh, and incidentally, local politics, I was saying to the young woman I was talking to before, local politics is a great place to get your feet wet in politics because it really the, the the issues matter and they affect people directly and you don't go someplace else to serve you're there nose to nose with your constituents and they'll yell at you and you get used to the idea that people yelling at you is part of the democratic process and i used to say to myself well i guess they're not doing this in the soviet union so i guess this is okay that they're doing it here in Canada." but um uh what was i going to say um Solving the world's problems, yes. gun control, <laughs> abortion. There were some, there were important political But was I say, every, every level of government I served in, see, get me before I totally demented folks, because <laughs> uh, here I might be too late. Um, everything I did, even if it was at the school board, I tried to use whatever powers I had and opportunities I had to do something. In other words, I didn't just want to sit there and go to meetings and look, look at me, I'm on the school board. So, for example, when I was, and I chaired the Vancouver School, I mean, I brought the International Baccalaureate Program into Vancouver High Schools. Um, you know, and, and years later, I met a young woman when I was teaching at Harvard and who came to see me and said, you know, I'm in Vancouver and I want to come to Harvard and I'm doing the International Baccalaureate Program. And I said, you can say thank you to me right now. <laughs> um, but the point is that every time I did something, and when I was in the provincial legislature and my party was government, but I didn't get along with the premier, so I wasn't in his cabinet. But I chaired a number of important legislative committees and traveled the province and made recommendations and did things. And there's every time I had a chance to do something, I did. So when I was the first woman to be Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, I said, this is historic. I need to reflect it in some way. So I convened a national symposium on women, law, and the administration of justice. And we sent a wonderful t team from the Department of Justice that went out and, and met people across the country and said, if we were to have such a symposium, what should be on the agenda? And they raised a lot of the issues. Um, and uh, it was a remarkably generative experience because, you know, I'm only one woman. I can't speak for every woman. You know, I've actually led a relatively privileged life. I'm a white, middle-class, university-educated uh, baby boomer from Vancouver. There's lots of women who have totally different experiences. So the question is, how do you bring them in and, and understand, you know, what, 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 they, what they want to do and to bring some, some uh, uh, create an agenda out of that. So that was part of how I, my agenda came about. And interestingly, a number of judges came to this um, symposium because when you are the minister of justice, judges will come because they know that you'll respect their independence and they won't be compromised in any way. And a number of them said, you know, before I came, I thought I was pretty liberal on these issues. And I realized I didn't know anything. So it was a remarkable experience. But also sometimes the agendas happen just, for example, the Supreme Court of Canada struck down the rape shield provisions of the criminal code. These are the provisions that protect a complainant in a sexual assault case from having to testify about prior sexual conduct. And the court struck it down, not because they disapproved of the idea, but they thought the bill, the, the legislation as it was written was too broad and could deny an accused a full and fair defense. So 
I'm the minister, what do I do? And some people didn't want me to legislate. And I thought, and it's funny, the court actually said, one of the judges said, you know, maybe this should just come up through the courts to define the law. And I thought, women can't be jurisprudential guinea pigs. If you're going to, you're going to lay a, a charge of sexual assault. And it's, only, it's not just women who get sexually assaulted. Um, you need to know what the rules of the game are going to be uh, if you t take the step of, 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 of uh, laying a complaint and, and having a charge laid. So anyway, um, it was a very interesting process and again reached out and consulted with a lot of people and the bill that we that we tabled and that was passed, it came to be known as the no means no law, but was a comprehensive redrawing of the sexual assault law that not only talked, we talked about what consent was, but also defined areas where as a matter of law, consent could not be found. But the point I'm making is that all of this happened because the court struck down a decision. Mm -hmm. The same as my gun control legislation, a man named Mark Lapine in December of, 19, uh, uh, of uh, 1989, I became minister in 90. Uh, went into a coal polytechnic in Montreal with a Ruger semi-automatic with 30 shot magazines and murdered 14 women engineering students and said you're all feminists and shot them. And this somewhat raised the level of gun control uh, on the public agenda. And my predecessor had said with our last gun control legislation had been in 68, he said we need to revise it, there are things, that there's loopholes, we need to, but all of a sudden it's at the top of the agenda. So Yes, I was able to legislate success, successfully in those areas, but the agenda wasn't set by me. And I think when you when you go into politics, you have to understand that sometimes you won't be in control of the agenda. You see what's happening in the United States as a result of the, you know, the George Floyd killing and all these other things where all of a sudden issues, they kind of explode and maybe people are ready for them, but you need a catalyst. So, you know, pretty... They look pretty resistant to change in yeah. gun control, though. It, it's, it does require a bit of... Well, in experience. Canada, we don't have the, any of that sort of Article 2 stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Canuckle heads are much more sensible. <laughs> I want to I, I wanna come back because there's, there's a remarkable aspect of your career that I, I, I think many people may not have, uh, have thought through, and I would love to hear how you thought about it. I mean, you invested an enormous amount of time and effort getting a PhD. Then you became a lawyer. Then you became a politician. And then you became a human rights and rule of law campaigner. And, and I guess my question is, where do you find the energy for this constant reinvention of yourself? And how hard was it to give up those identities that you forged along the way? Well, you know, I had political retirement thrust upon me by the Canadian electorate. So, you know, you don't always have a choice. Well, one of the things when I wrote a I wrote a memoir, uh, which you can get on Kindle, although it doesn't have numbered pages, called Time and Chance. And when I wrote my memoir, I, I wrote it, you know, to, to, while the memory was still fresh, what I had done. The French historian Guizot said most memoirs are written either too early or too late. Too early, you can't say all the things you want to say because people are still alive, and too late, nobody cares. But anyway, I wrote mine anyway. <laughs> but what was interesting to me was going back to write a story of mine, it was to see how consistent I had been. Uh, because when I was little, I was born, my parents were both World War II veterans. And World War II was very much, you know, it was on the TV, it was in the movies, and, and I remember reading books about the Holocaust. And, you know, it was just such a big thing. It was the biggest event of the 20th century. And I wanted to be part of a process that would make that not happen again. So when I was young, I, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be the first woman Secretary General of the UN. I had no idea how you did that. But I think the point is that I always wanted to do something that was a bit bigger than my life. You know, I wanted, didn't want to just sort of have a career that would just be, I wanted to be involved in, in bigger issues about the way the world went and how the world worked. I wasn't always quite sure how to do it. And sometimes you just kind of stumbled in and there's a, a wonderful writer, Mary Catherine Bateson, who was actually the daughter of the anthropologist, Margaret Mead, who wrote a book called Composing a Life. And she says that women often have much more uh, circuitous career paths because they often, you know, bump up and get things like marriage and children or moving to where their husbands are, are working or whatever. There's a lot of ways. But I think today, oh, for men also, I mean, because there are a lot of changes and technological changes, there are ways in which you don't necessarily map a career in a straight line. You may think, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a doctor and I'm going to do that. But then new opportunities arise, the world changes technologies 
destroy certain careers, but open up certain others. So I think for me, it was that my values, the things that were important to me never changed. How I expressed it varied depending on what opportunities I had. And sometimes doors closed in front of me and I had to go someplace else. Actually, somebody once said to me, because of who you are and what you can do, a lot of doors will open for you and you have to decide which ones to go through. Well, a lot of doors open for me, a lot of doors closed too. So, um, you know, the point is that I think um, if, if you look at my career, there's actually a kind of coherence to it. I've just found it, uh, you know, found different, different, you know, genres to play on my guitar. You know, I mean, it's, you know, if you're, we all do things and we all find different genres that we that we explore to do in whatever it is that we're doing um yeah well, speaking of your book um which uh, i i was uh, i was really struck that it, you named it time uh, and chance uh we spoke about this before and also i i ran because you can do that on kindle how many times you use the word luck uh, in your book and you are actually it's a pretty humble um um you have a humble approach to your career though you say like like all ambitious people i have worked hard to make my own luck but perhaps in no other endeavor are timing and circumstance as important to success as they are in politics now here at johns hopkins and in many other places um, there are actual masters that we teach we we say to students that you can tell the future you can predict you can measure risk you can really know what's going to happen with uh, with decision making and so on, and yet, is you... that legal? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we are. That's, there's actually a career in this, <laughs> and um, so it, it's it's very interesting because not many politicians would credit luck and chance with so much in their lives. Um, that at the same time, you don't really strike me as a person who went with the flow. Well, when I say I talked about making my own luck, in other words, to be a cabinet minister, the prime minister has to appoint you. So I tried to be somebody that a prime minister would want to appoint. And that didn't mean going, hey, appoint me. It meant conducting myself in such a way that it would inspire confidence. So when I, and when I got my first junior cabinet appointment, I had the good luck to sit on two cabinet committees. One was chaired by the deputy prime minister. The other was chaired by the minister of finance. And I did my homework and I did a good job. And I'm sure they told the prime minister, you know, Kim Campbell's really good. She's really strong. She always comes prepared. She's got good judgment, blah, blah, blah. You know, those, so it's the luck that, that who will see you. And you see this of performers you know, are artists that you can have be a lot of brilliant artists never get the recognition that their talent would deserve because they haven't been in the right place at the right time. And, but when you are, I think, see, I think it's really important because sometimes there, there is a hubris in thinking that everything that you've accomplished and you've achieved is because you're brilliant and clever. But there are a lot of brilliant and clever people around and they don't all get the same chance to achieve. So if you think that you're really hot, you know what, uh, it's really important to understand that you may have some privilege, uh, some good timing, and that somebody who matters, you know, took a notice of you and an interest in you and wanted to help you get ahead because they thought you you do well. So I think it's important to to recognize that. But as I try to make my luck, in other words, you don't just sit around, you know, you know, it's the old joke about the you know, a guy who's finally, you know, dies and goes to heaven, and he says to St. Peter, for years I, you know, I begged, I prayed every time, you know, to God, let me win the lottery, let me win the lottery. And you know, why didn't God ever let me win the lottery? And St. Peter said, Well, why don't you help us and buy a ticket? <laughs> you know, so you got to buy the ticket. You got to help make your own luck, so that uh, you know that's probably a terrible joke. I but, can't tell if anybody's <laughs> laughing because you're all wearing masks. I suppose <laughs> that must be a nightmare for a comedian to be performing during COVID. Oh my God! I mean, I, I, I want to push back on that just a little bit because you've set up this leadership college at the University of Alberta, and so so there must be something that you think is uh, is a teachable, learnable trait. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that prepares people for these kind of careers. Would you would you give us your top two or three things that people should should focus on if they want to go into a career in leadership? Well, um, the the curriculum of the of the Peter Lougheed Leadership College I think is quite brilliant and clever, if I do say so myself. Uh, but I would say two things that may be really important. Uh, one is that our students worked, were organized and worked with people not like them. They were worked in forums that were engineered to be as diverse as possible. So you want to be a leader, get out of your envelope. Get to know people who are not like you. Get to know people who study different disciplines, who bring different paradigms of decision making to problem solving. Understand what those different disciplines can offer to solving problems. So that was one of the first things. Secondly, understand that the way you think you think isn't how you think. There is a wonderful, wonderful, rich literature now in cognitive biases and barriers to good decision making, in ways in which we get into our own, get in our own ways, in ways we make bad judgments. And a lot of the, those I, the, you know, I got to know when I was trying to understand things that I'd experienced as a, as a woman. Um, and, you know, and came to understand that, that, you know, nobody who looked or sounded like me had ever been prime minister before. And for people, particularly for people who, journalists who covered national politics, this was extremely disconcerting because the landscape in which, for which they got their sense of how the world works and how the federal government worked didn't include anybody like me as prime minister. So even though they would sooner walk over hot coals than ever acknowledge that they were sexist, they needed to find a way to validate that sense of discomfort. So if I did any, you know, tiny thing, they would jump on, oh, you see, you see, she's not worthy. Whereas, I'll give you an example. So during the, the 93 election, I did not say that the election was, was not the time to talk about serious issues, but somebody wanted to distort something that I said about negotiating with the provincial governments to say that I said that. But my opponent said, Fani said the, the reports, stop nagging me about what I'm going to do if I'm elected. Let me get elected, then I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Which sort of sounds like you're not really wanting to talk about this. But you see, he belonged. This was Jean Chrétien. He'd been in politics for a long time. Oh, it's just Jean Chrétien putting his foot in his mouth, as he always says. It's just him, this speaking. Ha, ha, ha. Doesn't change our view. So what you need to know as, as a leader is you need to understand the barriers between you and good decision making and how you, you know how you can uh, make make terrible errors how you can miss uh, including people who have something important to add to the mix of your of your uh, your world of, of, of advisors etc so I say those two things to, to get out of your your own your comfortable uh, area to expose yourself to, to engage with people who are not like you and to look at the literature, uh, the social and cognitive psycholo psychological literature about how we make decisions and cognitive bias and the barriers to good decision making and try to understand where that might fit in the way you approach things. Those are the two. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in how that plays out in your, you had this encounter, you talked about speaking before the General Assembly of the United Nations, but also being at the G7. When, when you showed up as the first female Prime Minister of Canada in what I can only imagine was a G7 meeting populated only by men, um, was, was your gender important in that context or was it the state that you represented that mattered or, or how much is it a personal thing when you're dealing at that level of interaction? Well, you know, Madeleine Albright said something very interesting when she was the first woman to be American Secretary of State. She said, whatever people might have thought about me as a woman, the American Secretary of State is the 800 pound gorilla in the room. And I was the 800 pound gorilla, and they had to deal with me. So you get into circumstances where once you've got there, the role you're playing takes over. So if you're the Prime Minister of Canada, the G7, the fact that you're female might be, and incidentally, Margaret Thatcher, of course, had attended for many years as, as the Prime Minister of Great Britain. So I wasn't the first woman. Now it may have had an influence because I had a, a meeting, uh, at the American Embassy with Bill Clinton and my team, and Bill gave me a ride back to the meeting in his car. Uh, so maybe that was because I was a woman. Ha, I just joke, I always say I was alone in the car with Bill Clinton, but he was a perfect gentleman. <laughs> and uh, somebody said, that's because your, your, your hair wasn't big enough. But anyway, um, <laughs> just kidding. 
anyway, uh, but you get, you get to a point where a position, which when you get to often um, is, is more, almost more important than you. So in that case, uh, at the G7, I didn't feel that. Uh, Francois Mitterrand never said that I had the mouth of Caligula and the eyes of Marilyn Monroe, was it, or was it vice versa, the eyes of Caligula? That's what he said about Margaret Thatcher. He didn't say that about me, so I don't know. I feel neglected. <clears throat> so I want to I, 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 I want to bring Veronica back in, but I just want to I want to get your opinion on on something. Uh, and and it's, no, it's too big. It's too big because I really want to know the the time of politics that you talk about sounds so civil and interesting and the time of politics that we're living in right now sounds so different. Um, and, and so maybe at some point after Veronica asked her question, I could get you to reflect on why oh, that Social is. media. Social media. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I think that's an important question to, to deal with. So you, re you really think it's social media and it's not, uh, there's, there's many other reasons. I mean, also other people make careers out of explaining inequalities polarization, uh, people, that the increasing inequality between the rich and the poor and so on, used to social no, media. I mean, no, I, I think there's no question that inequality and the, the way globalization has played out, um, it doesn't have to be that way, but we need a lot of very smart policy making to correct the injustices that have resulted from processes which on another level have been extremely economically productive, but they're not equally economically productive. And I think that, that, and I don't really get it. I guess it started with the Reagan administration. You know, I mean, first of all, trickle down economics. I mean, I mean, I don't know what it takes to debunk, a uh, highly debunked uh, idea. But if it works for you, then you're selfishly gonna say, well, I like that idea because it works for me. Um, so I think inequality is, is very important. I think it has created a considerable amount of frustration. But I also think, and, and it's a public rhetoric. I mean, you know, when newspapers first came out in the 18th century, people wrote scurrilous things. So the notion about people writing slanderous things about people in public life and making stuff up about, up about them and, you know, all that kind of stuff, it's not new. But I think with social media, it is the ability to create communities of like-minded and similarly deluded people uh, who then play out these delusions in the political arena. And that I think is very worrisome. And I think, to be perfectly honest, I mean, I, I, I welcome the approach that's being taken in some governments to begin to now regulate social media because they've acted, I mean, I think Mark Zuckerberg and his pals have the moral, uh, uh, I mean, the, the moral outlook of war criminals. I mean, they are just, I mean, I, I can't even begin to describe the level of irresponsibility and wickedness that's involved in their inability and unwillingness to reckon with what they have created. And I don't think it means putting an end to social media. I think it means understanding that social media, you know, can be incredibly, incredibly destructive. And as I say, it is the creation of, as I say, not, We've always had, you know, there, like in Canada, you know, the Toronto Star was a liberal newspaper and, you know, the, the National Post was a conservative. I mean, we've always had outlets that have some kind of partisan identification. But I think the, um, the tribalism and ghettoization of certain ways of thinking and the, uh, the, the, the decline in respect for simple facts, much less expertise, uh, combines with that to make it very, very dangerous. Yeah, I, I couldn't help notice that when Eric asked the question about the rude environment, uh, you immediately thought of the US and the Reagan administration and, and so on. And I just wanted to think in a better universe where you would still be, let's say, Prime Minister of Canada, how would you deal with the US right now? It's like they say, how do porcupines make love? And the answer is <laughs> very carefully. And, um, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think there is an easy, I mean, very carefully. <laughs> um, it's really hard dealing with lunatics. And lunatics, who are your biggest trading partner, 
There is a tutty. There are some days when I wake up and I say, yes, I'm not prime minister. Oh, yay. I don't have to deal with that. But then I think, oh, that poor Schmendrick has to deal with it. And how's he going to do it? Anyway, uh, I think actually Justin Trudeau has been pretty deft. I think he's, uh, I think he has a certain amount of skill in, uh, but, but you can't, I mean, there's no simple answer how to deal with it. I do want to uh, get some voices from the floor into the conversation. So if you want to ask a question, please put your hand up. Um, I'll start making a list in the order in which I see hands. Um, so if you could go to Sahar over in the corner. Um, the, <clears throat> the best is to wait until the microphone comes uh, and, and then we can, uh, we can ask a question. Now, Sahar, I've used your name, uh, but I still want you to say it and then tell us where you're from. I'm from Berkeley, uh, California, um, and I wanted to ask a question kind of based off of my reading or understanding of your book. Um, to my understanding, a bit about the election that was lost in 1993 came from a disillusionment with the establishment politics that were in Canada at the time. And I feel that this disillusionment with establishment politics very much exists in the United States today. So my question is, how do we build trust or establish trust or continue trust between people and government? Well, I think, first of all, I'm not sure your analysis about establishment politics is exactly right. The, the election in 1993, I mean, there, there is a, perhaps an angle of it because two parties who could not have formed a government, the Reform Party in the West and the Bloc Québécois in Quebec, actually took our vote. And it was hard to understand that people would vote for parties that couldn't form a government. But people did, and perhaps that was a rejection for two different reasons in the two different voting groups of the, the status quo. Uh, I mean, when in the Bloc Québécois was formed by Lucien Bouchard, when the Michelet Accord didn't get, uh, was going down, and he had been a minister in our government and resigned and created this, this new uh, group. And actually, they wound up being the official opposition, which was extraordinary because there were enough votes of them uh, to do that. The Reform Party in the West had um, grown up with a sense of Western alienation. So Canada is always su susceptible to these kinds of regional views. Um, and so I don't, and, and Preston Manning who led it, you know, was always very critical of uh, national politicians and they were all at the trough and all this kind of stuff. And of course then, you know, when his group got elected into parliament, they, you know, they found that it wasn't exactly as they thought and they were doing the same thing. So I'm not sure it was just a rejection of establishment politics. I think it was a re rejection of some aspects of the status quo, but I think it was also um, a kind of an artifact of some, certainly with the, with the Bloc Québécois of developments of, of, uh, on the constitutional issue. Um, and I'm sorry, the second part of your question was how would I build trust? Um, I how would build trust? Well, you know, I think the way to build trust is to say what you're going to do and do it. Um, I think people become very cynical when they feel that politicians are lying to them and won't do what they, what they should do. But I think if you want, you also have to be a population that allows politicians to do that. You know, the, the climate change is a big issue. And Canada, of course, is an energy country. We have a lot of energy. And we're, we have to deal with the fact that at some point, fossil fuels are not going to be the source of our energy. And the head of one of the Calgary oil, oil companies, uh, Williams, uh, Steve Williams, who was headed, I think it was Syncrude or, or Suncor, one of the, Syncor maybe. He was very, a couple of years ago, he made this comment where he was very critical of climate deniers. He was saying, you know, climate change is real. And he was criticizing climate deniers and the politicians who pander to them. And I thought, you jerk. Why are the politicians pandering to them? Because you and your industry are spending a fortune to fund bogus front organizations whose whole purpose is to make the science of climate change doubt, uh, uncertain. It's not to convince people it's wrong, but to convince them that it's uncertain. And there's all sorts of documents out now, you're, you're interested in Exxon, all these things, that going back to the late 70s, when their own scientists told them that, client, that global warming was real, and you have put a fortune into trying to undermine people's ability to make intelligent decisions. 
And now you have the nerve to criticize politicians who are pandering to climate deniers. And a lot of those politicians are also in the thrall, thrall of these bogus scientists. There's a, there's a couple of them that got their start. And they're, they're nuclear scientists, actually, and they got their start undermining the science with respect to tobacco. You know, that tobacco causes cancer. And they put their scientific uh, uh, credentials, which had nothing to do with understanding the, with oncology or the understanding the effects of tobacco people. But they did it to try and create doubt so that governments would not make policy. So I think when we talk about building trust, it's not just what politicians do. It's that we all have to, it's like people criticizing the media in the United States for not taking Trump on for finding 89, you know, 50 shades of gray. Well, there's 50 uh, euphemisms for lying. And the problem is people need to know what's demonstrably false. There are some things that are opinions, but there are some things that are demonstrably false. So I think we as a culture, all of us can be part of that by saying, we're not going to put up with that stuff. And we are going to support honest politicians in making the tough decisions that today's issues require. And we are going to not tolerate people who are undermining what we know and are deliberately trying to confuse things for their own selfish reasons. And I actually think with the oil companies, I think you're looking at an absolutely Nuremberg perfect war crimes case. With ex I mean, we know, we, know, we know what they knew. It's not that they were mistaken. It's not that they thought, oh golly, you know, it's all going to work out. They knew and they deliberately hid the information while protecting their own ability to profit, you know, strengthening their pipelines, raising the level of their ocean going platforms because the seas were going to rise. They knew what was going to happen, but God forbid you should know and be able to make a smart decision about what you want governments to do. So building trust requires all of us to stand up for the truth, and to be prepared to call a lie a lie and to call out even the leaders of huge industries for deliberately committing i think crimes against humanity how else do you how else do you explain that when the future of the earth is, is at stake i mean this it's it's mind-boggling and your generation is going to have to deal with this and i hope some of you are becoming really hard-ass lawyers and are prepared to take these cases because the only way it's it's all going to come down to the money you know, and, you know, insurance companies are not going to insure anymore. And, you know, investments, you know, hedge funds are no longer investing in these things. And that's where it comes down to. And these people are going to have to have to deal with it. But once we get moving in the right direction, I think a lot of these people need to be hauled off to the war crime tribunal in The Hague and done in. Connor, did I see your hand up before? You, if you wait and then remind us of your name when you get the microphone. Hello, uh, my name is Connor O'Brien. I'm from Connecticut. Uh, thank you very much for your comments about the importance of democracy and the rule of law. Um, for myself and the other Americans in the room, we are uh, about to face an election in which the incumbent has been increasingly casting doubt on um, the ability of the democratic process to work. And there exists a, unfortunately, non-negligible chance that if he were to lose, he would not accept the results. How, in, in that kind of situation, how should we as scholars um, and site students look, look, look toward, uh, react to that kind of situation? I think what the danger is, is the, the notion that uh, there won't be a clear result. Although many people are suggesting because of so much early voting and mail-in voting that they, their results may be known sooner than you think. I think if the results are clear, I don't think there's any question. I mean, Donald Trump will go when he has to go because, you know, the Secret Service, whose job it is to protect the president, they're going to protect the guy. Let me tell you, when I, uh, when I lost the election in 93, the next day I had a different security detail because the prime minister's security detail were on a plane back to Ottawa to look after the prime minister elect, even though he wasn't sworn in yet. Uh, when I won the leadership, which meant that I would become the prime minister, you could tell I won because in the convention hall, a phalanx of Mounties was working their way up to protect me because I was, so the secret service, their job is to protect the president and the president elect. And 
you know, they're, they're going to do it. So I don't, but the real, the real question is whether Trump can create enough doubt about the result. And, you know, I'm not an American, I don't vote, so I don't have any say about that. But what worries me is the voter suppression. Uh, I mean, all of that stuff, but that's why this election is so important. There's a very good book that I recommend uh, by uh, Nancy McLean, who's a historian at Duke, and it's called Democracy in Chains. And it tells the story of the origin of a lot of this effort to use the state levels of government to undermine uh, civil rights, the creation of the Federalist Society and the judges that they've recruited uh, to go on the court that and, and uh, the current nominee to the Supreme Court is one of them. In other words, this, there, there is a whole movement and, I mean, you could call it a conspiracy that has been working to try to get to us to this very point. And it's interesting because Trump is in many ways their useful idiot. I don't think Donald Trump understands, you know, half of what is underlying this. I think he takes the Federalist judicial nominees because he thinks that's going to get him elected. And the reason why the Republicans are sticking with him, even though they have to hold their noses and they know what he is, is because they want to get those appointments. That's for them, because at the end of the day, what they want is an anti-civil rights, uh, pro-business, anti-regulation court, instead of courts, to uphold, to uphold their views. And he is the mechanism for getting there. So appalling as he is, that's what they're going to do. So this election is, I mean, I think the 2016 election was crucial. We've already seen terrible damage. But this election is very important. But, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have any magic answer to give you, except to say, don't put up with it. Uh, take to the streets if you have to. Use every vehicle you have. And we see, I mean, Europeans, that we've seen them, uh, uh, but even in the United States, people are, are, are just not, they're not putting up with it, but you can lose things. And we've, we're sitting in a place where people lost democracy. Uh, you know, Germany is, is a wonderful country, but Germany lived for several decades under a murderous tyrant. And the sad thing about it is that it's not just, it's not just what you experience it's that it puts the mark of Cain on a society so that people, even after the Hitlers are gone, the people who supported them feel they have to keep supporting them because it's too shameful to have been part of something that everybody thinks is that evil. And so the neo-Nazis and all these people, they, they, they fester there because living with that kind of a national shame is so intolerable. And I think the Germans have done very well. Uh, they've had some very wise leaders and they've faced a lot of things. Angela Merkel being, being you know, in a line of, of, of good leaders. But that's why you need to understand, it's not just a matter of getting rid of it, it's understanding the festering and in fact, the civil war, I mean, the whole, lost cause thing, the whole effort to turn back that, the whole effort to rewrite history, you know, by taking over state levels of government and the daughters of the Confederacy, you know, so that the Civil War had nothing to do with slavery and no, there was nothing bad about it. That's what this kind of lawlessness does to a society. It creates a wound uh, that divides it it makes people not wanting not want to accept it takes mature people to say our country was wrong and americans they're often their view of patriotism is my country right or wrong and that kind of misses the point it should be my country wonderful that i love and i'm going to make it as right as i can make it and we're going to face our our, our errors i mean i would say this is about canada i think we're a little better and maybe it's because we're Canadians and we're always apologizing and, you know, saying thank you to the ATM machine and stuff. <laughs> um, that, you know, but we've had some things that we've had to deal with. The, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission about our, our, our residential schools for Indigenous people. There's, you know, every country has those kinds of scars and original sin that they have to deal with. And for a lot of people, they don't ever want to deal with that and it, and it's, and it festers. And I think America is going to have a, 
just a tough time. But the thing is that other people love your country. You know, and, when, and I've often said to people, when you see demonstrations against the United States over the course of my lifetime, whether it's Vietnam, it's, it's not because people hate the United States. It's because when the United States doesn't live up to the values that have inspired people around the world, people feel lost. They feel betrayed. They feel scared. Because if they can't look to the United States to stand for those things, where can they look? And that's the, the sense of desperation. And that's, it's, it's interesting because Europeans are trying to figure out, you know, can we feel, can we feel the gap of that bulwark for, for law and order? But it's, so it's not time to be an American. I've got, I've got three more questions and I'm, I'm going to start that. over here. Um, so four more questions and, and I'll try to get, well. Well, why don't they ask the questions and then I can try and. Great, I'm going to, I'm going to collect three then in a row. So if I could start there. All right. Hi, I'm Aspen from Seattle, Washington. Uh, you referenced earlier the importance of respect and dialogue with opposition, particularly in your time in government. Um, but particularly as a woman in politics, as a leader, how did you navigate when the other side was not willing to demonstrate that same mutual respect and enter in civil dialogue? And where did you find success or maybe failures along there? Okay, right here in the center. Hi, um, I'm Eduardo from both uh, France and Italy. I, was, uh, I wanted to ask you if you think that the fact that Christia Freeland uh, is a woman is still an obstacle for her to become the next Prime Minister of Canada in 2020, because Canada for us is usually seen as a very progressive um, country. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take one more in this round because I think three is really uh, really too much to manage. So Bianca. Hi, I'm Bianca from Padova, uh, up north, and I wanted to ask. Um, in 1988, uh, Turner instructed his liberal senators to not ratify the U.S. trade deal, right? And he, he, was, he was judged at the time, but it, he still stuck it to the man, in a sense, by just doing that action. Today, it's an action like that seems unfeasible to imagine. So how do you think cross-state accountability has evolved? Uh, and, and what is a politician's power today as globalization makes it a lot harder to, to, to navigate how states can keep each other accountable with how linked their politics and economics have become. Okay, very quickly, um, Aspen, your, your question about what did I do when others would not enter into civil dialogue. You know, I didn't actually have a lot of those kinds of experiences. Um, the, I mean, I, in my own caucus, if there were people who really didn't like something I was gonna do, I mean, the door was always open. But, uh, and maybe it was a different time. I had a lot of people yelling at me, and I should say, well, maybe I was thinking of people outside of Parliament. I would go places and people would yell, but I never, um, you know, I never reacted in anger and I never uh, gave them the finger or anything, although some of my male uh, predecessors have done that kind of thing. Because um, I think as a woman, you can't really get, get away with it. Uh, so I don't know today, uh, there may be more of that, but. It, that wasn't a big issue. I mean, I, I had a lot of, I dealt with a lot of people who were just mad. And sometimes people didn't want to engage in dialogue because they were just ideologically opposed to you and they didn't want to let you come off looking like a reasonable person. But it never was, was fatal for anything because people who did that were often fairly marginal. And, um, and you just had to be patient. But, um, but it may, I don't know, it may be harder now given, you know, with trolling and all that kind of stuff. But um, it wasn't an association. Um, Eduardo, when you asked about Christian Freeland, um, I think she's very well positioned to succeed Justin Trudeau as leader of the Liberal Party. I think she's outstanding. Uh, I think she'll be a, an excellent uh, finance minister. She's very smart. As, as, as a, it's probably the best qualified that we've had in generations, even though a journalist said, oh, she's just a journalist. And I said, well, 
maybe you're just a journalist, but she's a Rhodes Scholar, Oxford, Harvard educated uh, finance writer for the Financial Times and the Economist, head of the Financial Times Bureau in Moscow, wrote the, a prize winning business book on the new rich. I, mean, I, mean, I think she knows what she's doing. And I was saying to the young women um, that one of the things that's really interesting about her is that she's, they, people describe her as having great emotional intelligence, which is a very important skill as a leader, particularly in that, in that context. And when she finished the NAFTA negotiations, she invited the American negotiators to her home in Toronto and cooked them a roast beef dinner and, you know, made all, you know, friends and everything. Very important. But when she was appointed finance minister, the two of the most recalcitrant premiers, because she, she had been serving as minister for federal provincial relations before she was made finance minister. And two of the most recalcitrant premiers were standing out there praising her to the skies because they'd been working with her. So clearly she has great skills. And some of the best leadership skills are not the ones anybody reads about in the paper. It's how you are building relationships with the people whose cooperation matters. And one of the things you'll have to do as finance minister is get provincial cooperation. But I think that's an incredibly good foundation for being a successful leadership candidate. Now, whether she'll be elbowed out of the way by some guy who thinks it's his, it's his turn, um, only time will tell. But I think that she's winning a lot of respect uh, for just being incredibly effective and smart so I would I would uh, support her and um, and uh, Bianca what, what Turner did um, when he uh, in, in 1988 the election was called when the Canada US free trade agreement could not be ratified the Canadian Senate would not ratify it because at that time there was still a majority of liberals in the Senate our Senate is, is a, appointed by the, the party in power the liberals had been in power so long that the Senate was still a majority uh, it was, um, given that the Liberals had run against the, the free trade agreement, it may have been under, understandable. I think what he did, what he also ran, because he thought that the Conservatives would lose the election, because the last party that went to the Canadian people on a platform of reciprocity with the United States had, was beaten, and that was the Liberals in 1911. So I think he assumed if they could force an election on the issue, that they would win. But in fact, they didn't. But I think also the fact that it was the fourth year of the mandate and that the Conservatives had not run on a platform of free trade. Uh, the free trade came out of a recommendation from a Royal Commission in 1985. The, Liberals, they were, the government was elected in 84. 85, the, Royal, the McDonald Royal Commission, which actually was created by a previous Liberal government, had brought forth its recommendations on Canadian, uh, uh, it was a, a very detailed study of the Canadian polity and economy. And they had suggested that Canada enter into negotiations with the United States on a free trade agreement. And Brian Mulroney had actually during the 84 election been negative about such a thing because often the knee jerk reaction is to think that, oh, it's a small country, you'll be overwhelmed. But actually in free trade agreements, the small countries often do better. But because of the nature of the recommendation and the the gravitas and the depth of knowledge of the people who had put this forward and the nature of the study, he had to do him credit, he rethought it and thought, well, maybe I was wrong. Uh, we should do this. But it wasn't something he had gone to the Canadian people with. It was a big deal. So for Turner to have done that, you know, it was a risk and it didn't pay off because the Canadian people, in fact, supported the, the, the free trade agreement. But I think it was also cleaner that after the election, the government came with a mandate to implement it. So I see that as politics played probably reasonably. I think the timing of it uh, at the end of a mandate, time for a new, uh, a new mandate, the, the, the Liberals had run against, uh, no, sorry, they didn't run against, they ran, sorry, they, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. They hadn't taken a position, Susan, because it wasn't an issue until the 88 election. But I think that it was, it was, there were worse crimes. The bigger crime was the Liberals not being willing to pass the GST legislation, not to pass, not, not willing, the, 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 the senators. But then the government was able to do something which had not been done before, which was to appoint eight new senators, because there were now by that time enough conservatives in the Senate that, that made a difference to the majority. And my lawyers were in court arguing for the constitutionality of it, and it was totally constitutional. It just had never needed to be done before. But that was a more, interesting political question to use the power of the Senate to defeat a tax tax bill passed by the House of Commons. Uh, to defeat it by the unaccountable Senate, that was not a good thing, but we deked them out by appointing more senators. But I think Turner's decision was, uh, yeah. 
I wasn't in, in, in Parliament then. I, that was the election that elected me. And maybe if I was there, I would have been mad and ranting. But I think it was a gamble. And it was, actually it was a gamble that he lost. But I think it was a gamble that wound up with a much cleaner mandate for an important policy uh, by the government of Canada. So I'm going to I'm going to get two questions from the room, and I've got one question online, and then and then I'll uh, after after Prime Minister Campbell responds, I'll, I'll turn over to Veronica to close us off. Okay? Now was it it was you who had your hand up right there? No, no, no. The 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 woman in front of you. No, in the meantime, I just want to say you have got to be the least conservative conservative I've ever heard. So. <laughs> I was a progressive conservative, also known as a red Tory. So. <laughs> Um, hello, uh, Prime Minister Campbell. My name is Bo Chen, and I'm from Toronto, Canada. So I actually have a question about um, you being outside of Canada and then coming back to make contributions to the Canadian political scene um, after being abroad for so many years. And we know that Michael Ignatieff, um, who also ran for Prime Minister in Canada, he was demonized for being an outsider because he had spent so much time outside of Canada before coming back. So I was just wondering um, if you could speak to how being abroad um, and spending, you know, substantive time- As opposed there, to being abroad. Uh, right. <laughs> could um, help with, um, could, how does that contribute to being a leader back home? And how has it informed your views on Canadian politics and being a leader in Canada? Okay, leave. My name is Liv, I'm from Germany, and I have a question. Um, so over the past years, there has been a global movement, the so-called incel movement, so a movement of men who believe that it's their right to have a woman and who resort to violence, who don't shy away from violence in order to get what they want. And Canada is a very, has, a, as far as I know, the biggest, in one of the biggest incel communities in the world. And in May, the first ever, the first, boy ever was charged with an incel-related terrorist attack. So uh, I don't know if you can reply to that question, but why Canada? Why, what is it about Canada that makes it such a, that gives it it's such a big ground for this community to grow of men who take them? So in the, the last question is going to come from Ben Novak, who writes the question in from, from Hungary. And Ben, I apologize, but I'm going to paraphrase to shorten it up. Uh, and, and the question is, um, how do you, how would you deal uh, as prime minister, how would you deal with countries like, like Hungary and Poland? These are countries that benefit from their economic relationship with the European Union and from their security relationship with NATO, uh, and, and yet seem to be turning away from democratic values and adopting a kind of illiberal authoritarian uh, pattern of state stewardship. Boy, you guys have good questions. First of all, very quickly, the one about Michael Ignatiev. Um, I think it was a problem for Michael Ignatiev, and I think, um, I could tell you a long story when I think it occurred to me one to be Prime Minister. He was watching me and, and Mary Robinson speak at a panel at Harvard, and I think he wanted to have the title. But anyway, um, I think with Michael Ignatiev, it wasn't just that he was abroad, but I don't think he had, he's very smart, a very smart guy, and, and, and he comes from a very distinguished Canadian family, but I don't, also don't think he has good political instincts. I mean, I think you know, I think he's, he's courageous and good, and he went to, to Budapest to run the, uh, the, the European University, so I have nothing bad to say about him. But I just think that, but there was also a sense of entitlement. Um, you know, politics is not an abstract exercise. Real flesh and blood people are affected by what you do. And I think when people feel that, okay, you've done this in your career, and you've done that, and now the only thing that could cap that the rest of your career is that you could be prime minister. But I also fault the Liberal Party, because they came and recruited him. They're always looking to pull a rabbit out of the hat. It's why the current prime minister is named Trudeau. You know, it's a lot easier to get somebody with name recognition uh, than to actually uh, anoint one of your own uh, people, including several excellent women who might have made great leaders. So um, anyway, but I have no intention of going back to be prime minister again. And um, I, uh, I think that when I was prime minister, the fact that I had lived out of the country, I did my graduate work in England, I traveled in the Soviet Union for three months, I'd been to Cuba, I'd spent time, you know, I think my being out of uh, the, uh, the country was certainly helpful. I think that having a, 
a broad view of what's happening in the world. It can be very helpful. And if you get that through travel and living abroad, that's excellent. But I think there's also a way in which you need to have an intimacy with your country and have people feel that you, you're a part of that. And I think with Michael Ignatiev, uh, it just didn't, didn't quite work. A lot of it was also, was also timing too. I mean, it was just a, a hard time to be a liberal leader. But I think that, that he's a very admirable and, and smart and clever person. I just think that um, I, when he said he wanted to do that, I thought, oh, Michael, really? You know, you just, you, you, you. because I knew him at Harvard and I didn't see any sign that he was engaged with Canadian issues. So um, in terms of Germany, uh, your, uh, Liv, your question about the incel movement, I didn't realize that Canada was the big center for incels. And I like to say, well, you know, the cold winters make it hard to court. I don't know, but um, that's our shame if we are. Um, and I'm not sure where that comes from. I know we have we have pockets of right wing kind of loony type people. Um, I'm actually going to look this up after. I mean, you told me about that because I um, I think all it may be a, a, also a, you know an offshoot of, of populist movements in general because populism is is not good for women. If any of you women are tempted to be seduced by populist leaders, don't be because the bottom line is it ain't good for girls. Uh, the, one of the things that, that uh, uh, it links up with is people who think that you deserve to be barefoot, pregnant, and chained at the sink, and uh, not doing anything else. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't really have an answer to your question of why we have we have it, uh, because on the other hand, we have, you know, our prime minister is very, uh, you know, he said this comes up as a feminist, and you know, when he created his gender equal cabinet, and another political leader said to him, why did you create a gender equal cabinet? Why didn't you just appoint on merit? And he said, if I appointed on merit, I'd have had more women. So, you know, what I would not finally have a woman finance minister, which has been a long time coming. So, you know, we're not totally beyond hope, but I'm worried that you say that. And I'm gonna look that up because hmm. this no, see, I think this notion, you know, a lot of people don't, you know, what is it, the, you know, the Rolling Stones, you can't always get what you want. And who was it? Was it Hopkins who talked about people living lives of quiet desperation? Who made that comment? It's a very famous quote. I should know it. And, and, and living, I mean, for men and women. And after the First World War, when so many men were, were killed. I mean, the reason why there were so many women getting PhDs and stuff in the 20s is because there were no men for them to marry. My grandmother was one of five girls who were friends in Scotland and she came to Canada and she was the only one who married because my grandfather was in the Canadian army but got invalided out with suspected TB. So there were no husbands for this. So for, there's, you know, Russia, the, the, the demographic imbalance in Russia after World War II. So, and that's why the men were so obnoxious because they all grew up in, in these women dominated families that treasured them because they were so rare because so many of the men had died. So there are a lot of societies where people are not getting love um but the fact that you have a right to have uh, have it provided for you it's not really quite like socialized medicine it's uh, anyway i don't have an answer to that very important final question about the um about hungary and poland very worrisome i think the eu needs to work its leverage i and, and NATO. I mean, I think if we're if we're we're losing the democratic accountability, uh, we don't want to be sharing our secrets. Um, and it's horrifying and sad, and, and Poland in particular. But I think those who are I'm not in the EU, and maybe when I come to visit Veronica at the EU Center in Fiesole, we'll have conversations about this, and you'll have people who have views. I think in these situations, there's always the question: Is there any sign of the possibility of change in other words is there an opposition are there people there who could turn it around so that if the eu keeps faith they might be able to do it or is the better uh, uh tactic to kick them out of the eu i mean i remember when the accession happened i mean these weren't always in the european union and they benefit a lot by the european union so why should you know, you people in Italy be paying taxes to go and support people who are uh, anti-democratic and authoritarian. So I don't have the answer, but I don't think it's something that, that, that should be just accepted. I think it is something that needs to be responded to. Um, 
and I'm not wise enough to know exactly uh, or knowledgeable enough to know exactly what the, the optimal path is or what people are doing. But the short answer is it scares the wits out of me. Uh, and it makes me very sad because I've been to both of those countries and, uh, and I know the history and going backwards is not the answer. And particularly for women, it is not the answer. These populist leaders are very dangerous for the status of women. On the other hand, if they had the good sense to select women as their political leaders, maybe they would turn them in a different direction. That's a story for another day. No, don't kick the Eastern Europeans out of the EU, please. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's the last That's life why, life. as I say, I mean, you want to you want to boot them up. What you say is, I remember when China was lobbying to be in the WTO when I went to Infinite, and I was at, at Harvard at the time teaching there, and, and I would go to all these conferences about should China be in the WTO? Should China not? You know, and the usual conclusion was the only thing worse than China in the WTO was China not in the WTO. Mm -hmm. So yeah. maybe the only worse thing than Poland and Hungary in the EU is Poland and Hungary not in the EU. I don't know. The question is, does the EU, is it a lifeline for people who want to make change there? Or is it just being ripped off by governments who have uh, a, a totally different agenda? I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I, I think it's it's, it's great to hear you um, talk. I, I wonder, I've, I've never listened to a speech of yours when you were in office, but it's quite amazing how relaxed and straightforward uh, women are outside of office. And I'm, I'm thinking now for this last question, um, you know, Hillary is also, looks like a very different person. So my last question for you is, when are you launching your podcast? Um, the, the, we already found the name, it's going to be Red Tory. Red Tory, okay. Okay. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, who would play you in a biographical movie? Oh. <laughs> Which you can text later in the, and we'll, we'll upload it. Well, but, but just so I was, the I, podcast. More I will say, I, I, I am trying to figure out what I could do to at least be part of the conversation because I'm so concerned about it. I don't have any illusions that I can make, make changes. I don't have any power. Uh, there, but sometimes there can be power and powerlessness, so I can perhaps uh, uh, share my views, and, and I would like to do that. Incidentally, I mean, I, I've known Hillary for, for a long time, and I and I think it's great that she's doing that podcast. But, you know, I'm actually not that much different from what I was like in office. I had a friend who said to me, he was a very well-connected politically, and he said, you're the only politician I've ever known who's exactly the same in, in uh, private as you are in public. So... That may be why I got into trouble. I don't know because I was <laughs> a bit too candid. But um, uh, the the final thing that you asked was, who would you want to play you? Who, who would I want to play? Me? Well, I don't know, but I will tell you. I I had a boyfriend in high school who didn't stay my boyfriend all that long when I got to university, we broke up and he never forgave me for outgrowing him. I mean, I don't know why people think that when you go out when you're 16 and you're gonna, you know, live forever, uh, be together to have forever. When I turned 17, I just, I threw him over for somebody who was 22. Anyway, so years later, I saw him at a high school reunion. This was after I was out of office and he had was threatening to, to write a tell-all memoir about our love affair when we were in high school. <laughs> this is something, you think somebody's gonna be interested in anyway. So uh, fortunately somebody persuaded, and, and, and he's telling me this as if I'm going to, you know, think this is a good idea. And I'm looking at him like, you know, you're just on a sandwich board that walk saying, I am a, that bad word that begins with A, I am an A. <laughs> anyway, but the one thing he said to me is that I think that Bridget Fonda should play you in the movie. So this was some time ago. So. Um, I don't know, it depends on what, what age I am being depicted, but... Um, well, think about it. You I never know. know. The trouble <laughs> is, I'm so out of it, I don't even know who the cute young actresses are now, so I can't even, you know, solve my own ego by naming somebody. But um, as, long as, as long as it's cute, cute somebody... Cute. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, or on that... rural street for the older me, how's that? <laughs> on that note... Um, Prime Minister Campbell, thank you so much for a really fascinating conversation. It was just wonderful. Thank you, and I'm counting on you all to save the world. <laughs> we do have a couple of tokens uh, that we'd like you to take away with you. I'll ask Veronica to hand them over. One is something to, to keep, and the other is something to eat. Uh, so I hope you'll enjoy it. Well, I didn't get a body like this by not eating presents when people gave me. <laughs>
Thank you very much, really, and I wish you all the best. Uh, I'm so hopeful. For, I'm sorry that it's a difficult world, but you know, that's the crucible in which greatness gets formed. Uh, you know, I think I think when Bill Clinton was president, I think Bill Clinton 9/11, I think Bill Clinton had kind of 9/11 envy because he kind of wished that a terrible crisis had happened when he was president. That you know, real leaders want to be able to deal with something. So that's probably a terrible thing to say about Bill Clinton because I know him quite well. So. Maybe that was a secret that he was telling me, but anyway. Um, is kneading is being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you all.